This is the long-awaited Sigma 70-200 f2.8, and today we're going to review this lens and compare it to the Sony GM2 version. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Dunn, and focus pulls are my love language. All right, as usual, some disclosure. Sigma lent me this lens to make this review. I don't get to keep it. No money changed hands, and Sigma doesn't get any input on this video's production or get to preview before it's posted. This video does have an actual sponsor though, and that's Nebula. Also, the Sony 7200 that I'm comparing against is my own personal lens and wasn't borrowed from Sony. And I'm testing the E-mount version of this lens, and the sample images I'm going to show were captured on my A1, but there's also an L-mount version if that's the system you prefer. Now, I'm going to start by talking about the build and ergonomics, but I just want to say up front that I'm a big fan of this lens for the money, despite the criticism I'm about to unload. This lens really shines in the image samples I'll show later on, but its weakest point is its handling. Okay, so starting from back to front, no issues on the back. It, it is weather sealed according to Sigma. It's dust and splash resistant, so, you know, there's gaskets and stuff like that. But my first complaint comes with the tripod collar. Now, adjusting it is actually quite nice. There's just a little knob here that you loosen, and then you can turn the collar like this. And there's little stops to give you feedback that's actually quite strong to let you know when you're at, you know, 90 degrees around the lens. That's great. Those aren't complaints. In fact, I think this is one of the best implementations of that that I've seen. Although maybe it does make a little bit of noise if that's an issue. However, what I dislike is I often like to remove the foot from these tripod collars when I just want to use it handheld. And often that's how I use my 7200. You can see on the Sony one that I already have it removed. And on the Sony one, it's super easy. You just press the button and it slides off. But on the Sigma, you can see there's actually four screws that require an Allen wrench to remove. And when you do take them off, there's nothing underneath there to, you know, there's not like a quarter 20 or whatever. So basically, I, I don't think they were intending for the tripod foot to come off. And it's not an easy task to do, which does annoy me a little bit. So normally with the Sony one, I would put the collar on the top and then I would set it down like this. But you can see you got the knob on the bottom. So you have to find some kind of weird position for it where both the knob and the foot aren't in the way in order to set the camera down. But now it's blocking the switches. Just it, for a tripod collar that performs so well, it's so strangely designed when it comes to just sort of basic ergonomics that it frustrates me. But again, I do really like the clicky stops. And then we have an array of switches. No complaints here. We've got an AFMF toggle, a focus limiter selector, and then switches for the image stabilization here. And then you have the ability to de-click the aperture ring. And there's also a lock you can enable that stops you from accidentally rotating and if you just want to leave it on A and control with the camera. That's all great, no complaints. Next up is the focus ring. Yes, the focus ring, not the zoom ring, which is another complaint. And it's okay as far as, you know, how it feels, it feels fine as far as turning it, but it is non-linear, meaning that it's acceleration based. And if you turn it slowly, it takes forever to go from minimum to infinity, but then you can turn it faster after. It, it's hard to repeat focus pulls. I, I really don't like it. It's quite disappointing to see that they would put that they're sticking with a sort of non-linear design with these lenses. And then also, like I mentioned, the zoom ring is in front, which the zoom ring is, is nice to turn. It's got a good distance between the 70 and 200, and it, there's quite a bit of resistance, so you can really dial in the focal length that you want. But for this lens, based on where the balancing is and the size of it, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to put the rings in that position. On the Sony, the focus is in front and the zoom is in the back. Now, if this is a much bigger lens, you know, 200 to 600 or something, then I could see it. And with some of the larger Sigma lenses, I think it makes sense as well to put the zoom further out because I feel like that's how you would hold the lens. But on this lens, I find that I'm more comfortable choked up more, which puts my hands right on the focus ring, but the focus ring isn't great on this lens. This is where I'd want the zoom to be, which on the Sony, it's perfect. I'm right here and I'm zooming. And if I'm using autofocus, which I am most of the time, I don't need to worry that the focus ring's up there. And size-wise, they're actually quite similar the Sigma, as you can see, is just a little bit taller, but it does weigh quite a bit more. I think it's 30% more than the GM2. So that makes this 1,345 grams, which is pretty much right around three pounds. And my last critique about the build involves the hood. This has the older design where you turn this knob down in order to tighten the hood. It goes on fine, but it's just, a, I like a satisfying click lock. This doesn't have that. I'm not trying to be too nitpicky. It's just that there's quite a few ergonomic things about this lens that annoyed me that didn't annoy me at all on the Sony lens. So maybe I've just been spoiled by the Sony lens, but I feel like it got all these things right. So I would definitely give the nod to the Sony when it comes to build and ergonomics, but the price difference between these lenses is huge. And so I'm not sure if that's enough to you know, bridge that gap for most people, because last time I looked at the price of the GM2, it's gonna be 12 or $1,300 more than what this Sigma is gonna be selling for US. And I think when I show you the images in Lightroom in a second here, 
you might have a hard time seeing that twelve or thirteen hundred dollars difference in the image quality because the Sigma does well to either almost match and in some cases actually beat the Sony. And when the Sony wins, they're not huge victories. But let's boot up Lightroom now and take a look at those images. But before that, don't you hate that segue? The one that you know undoubtedly precedes the sponsor segment, like this one for the sponsor of today's video, Nebula. But here's the cool thing. If you were watching this video on Nebula right now, where it's already live, you wouldn't be hearing this ad. Instead, we'd be pixel peeping in Lightroom because Nebula is a completely ad-free platform filled with an impressive collection of high quality educational channels and creators. And I've even uploaded a good portion of my back catalog to Nebula. So perhaps if after this video, you wanted to go back and watch my original review of the Sony 7200 GM2, well, you can watch that on Nebula as well. And again, with no ads. There's also a lot of fabulous exclusive content on Nebula as well, like the Modern Conflict series from Real Life Lore and Jetlag, the most exciting travel game show on the internet, either of which are probably worth the price of admission on their own. And if you're a fellow content creator, you'll love the included Nebula classes that feature courses from those same incredibly successful creators sharing their hard learned secrets to making their content. So sign up using the link below and get 40% off the annual plan, which works out to just $2.50 a month, and you'll get access to all of Nebula and Nebula classes. Hell, I suppose if you really wanted to, you could sign up now and then finish watching this video over on Nebula. But in either case, let's get back to Lightroom. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your continued support. Okay, now these first few images here are about close focusing. And you'll notice that the Sony close focus is a lot better, especially at 70 millimeters. That was one of the cool things about the GM2. On the left is the Sigma, and I'll try to keep the Sigma on the left for most of these. And on the right is the Sony, and you can see at 70 millimeters, the Sony gets much closer than the Sigma does. This is the minimum focus on both of them. At 200 millimeters, it's actually more equal because the Sony isn't as impressive at 200 millimeters and the Sigma gets slightly better, but the Sony still wins. So if close focusing is something you like to do, and it's a huge part of why you would buy the lens, the Sony is the clear winner. But there's two things that the Sigma does incredibly well when it comes to focusing. One is crash zooms don't go out of focus, which I've had issues with other third-party lenses before. It's not perfectly par focal. I tested it. I'll show you a couple images in a second. It does go out slightly, and the Sony's maybe a little bit better. But if you just slam it from 70 to 200 in video, I found that it didn't really drag on the focus too much, which was nice. So if you want to use it for that purpose, I think you'll be okay. And second is the focus breathing. Focus breathing is really, really well controlled on the Sigma, whether at 70 or 200. It might even be slightly better than the Sony, which is something I praise when reviewing the Sony originally. And it's a good thing too because focus breathing compensation in the body isn't going to be available with third-party lenses. So it's great that this lens is so well controlled without relying on that compensation. This was just to show what I was saying when I said that the Sony is a bit more par focal. If you focus at one end of the focal length and then zoom to the other and you take the photo again, you can see the Sony kept its sharpness really well where the Sigma is slightly off. Maybe that's not too important to you, but if it is important to you, then again, the Sony is slightly better in this regard. Also, the Sigma makes a bit of noise when focusing. It sounds like there's like a tiny dial-up modem inside there, and the Sony is completely silent. It's not that loud, especially not if you're just in an environment that even has slightly raised ambient levels. I don't think you're gonna be able to hear it, but when I was doing my focus breathing test, it was completely silent, and I was right in there, you know, like looking for focus breathing, and I could hear it. I'll give you an audio sample now with boosted levels, so you can hear what I'm talking about, but just keep in mind, in the real world, it doesn't, it's not as noticeable but it's something to be aware of in case your work requires you to be in absolute silence. Now, despite that little bit of noise, the autofocus on this lens is terrific. It's really reliable and really fast. However, it does have a limitation when using it on Sony cameras. The L mount version does not have this limitation, however. I recently posted a tweet where I was asking, does anybody know anything about this 15 frames per second limit that people have been talking about on Sony for a while? Because I'd never seen anything official on it. I've heard a lot of different versions, so I'll give you the final thing from my testing and from, from asking around, especially if you're following that tweet. You can put the camera on autofocus continuous and have a third-party lens connected on your Sony camera, and you can still fire off faster than 15 frames per second. But if you're actively tracking something using the Sony camera, then you'll find that the burst speed slows. On my A1, I can shoot up to 30 frames per second in certain modes, and if I just have the lens pointed at something static, even if the camera is an AFC, it goes 30 frames per second. But as soon as I start actively tracking, you can hear the burst rate slow to a maximum of 15 frames per second. So the L mount version isn't gonna have that problem, which suggests something about the lens. And also, this lens has Sigma's best you know, high-speed linear motors in it, 
There's really no reason why it should be limited to 15 frames per second when some of Sony's first party slower lenses aren't. So maybe that was, you know, a safeguard. I think it's clearly an artificial limit or else the L mount version should have it too. So maybe it was to help consumers, you know, in the old days when third party lenses weren't as reliable. But these days, these modern third party lenses, especially this one, are really fast focusing. So I think that's something Sony should remove since it doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore. But just be aware. If you want to fire faster than 15 frames per second while continuously tracking, you're not going to be able to do it on this lens. And then this lens becomes the mandatory 7200 in that case. But I really would urge Sony to rethink how they're implementing that when it comes to lenses that are this fast, like this Sigma. Okay, now let's talk about chromatic aberration. I was really impressed with the Sigma. If we punch right in here, we can see that the Sony has great control over chromatic aberration, but the Sigma is even better. Uh, I'm a little bit closer than the Sony again because of close focusing, but we can see that over here, the Sigma on the left, it looks really neutral. I'm just seeing black and white throughout the frame. But on the Sony, I'm seeing a little bit, it's a minor amount, but I'm seeing a little bit of like a green and a little bit of a magenta here and there. But if we zoom out, you know, it's not that big of an issue on either lens, but it is great to say that the Sigma for less money actually has better control over chromatic aberration. And for a more practical test using a fence, as we go out of focus here, I don't really see much fringing in either direction, which is nice. And then at 200 millimeters, I mean, if I really, really, really pixel peep here, and I zoom way in, I can see the slightest amount right there. And if you're at home going, what is this guy talking about? Exactly. That's how good the chromatic aberration control is on this lens. Okay, moving on to Boca. Again, Sigma on the left. I would say this is actually pretty comparable. The Sigma is a little bit dirtier inside of the orbs here where the where the Sony's a bit smoother. But if we look at, you know, how soon they start to cat's eye, they're, they're pretty similar. A slight nod to the Sony G Master, but you know, I don't think I would make this affect my buying decision too much, but the G Master is slightly cleaner. If we look at them at 5.6, then the cat's eye is mostly gone. We can see that we have an 11 bladed aperture on both. And again, the Sony is slightly cleaner, but I wouldn't, put that as a big mark against the Sigma. Okay, now let's talk about sharpness. In the center of the frame, the Sigma's on the left, the Sony's on the right. You can let your eyes be the judge. I mean, from this distance, anyway, looking at these images, I don't see a huge difference. The Sigma might actually be slightly better to my eye, but I do notice a little bit of fringing uh, when I come across here. The Sony has just a little bit of color fringing. Again, a very minor amount, but I do see it. And I don't see it on the Sigma. So points of Sigma there. But if we move up to the corner, we can see that the Sony actually performs better for retaining its sharpness all the way out at the edge compared to the Sigma. However, if we switch over to 200 mil, first of all, the fringing is a bit more noticeable now on the Sony. You can see right here where again, the Sigma is still very, very clean. But now if we move out to the edge and take a closer look, I would say that they're a lot more equal. Yeah, the Sony is sharper, but it has slightly worse fringing. When it comes to vignetting and distortion, I think it's better to actually look at them sort of zoomed out like this. I would say that they seem very similar. They both are showing some pincushion distortion, as you can see on the edges here. The vignetting on the Sigma might be slightly worse. Now, I've received Lightroom correction profiles for the Sigma already, and obviously the Sony, you can turn them on. Usually things like vignetting and distortion aren't that big of a deal because they're gonna be corrected in the camera, but I just wanted to show you they're pretty similar, but maybe 2% worse vignetting on the Sigma. But again, an incredible job for comparing it to the G Master for something that costs, you know, $1,300 more. Now, these next few images are not comparisons. They're just the Sigma. Uh, this one is the show Flare, which there is some, but it's really, really well controlled. You can see, I, I like to do the shot because this area on the frame on the left should be black. And so if we're losing a lot of contrast, you normally see something crazy happen there, but it's not. We have really good contrast across the frame still. And just a little bit of artifacts here. The sun stars, you know, look nice. Our black to white ratio is fantastic. I'd say the flare is really well controlled here. And if we move a little bit so you can see how the artifacts move, this is what we're talking about. We do have a little bit of contrast reduction rate around here in the frame. This wasn't even with the hood on. So I'm, I'm happy with the flare on this lens. Also, I stopped on the shutter speed a lot in this shot and I just thought it looked kind of crazy. I don't know what this is, but it looks wild. I kind of like it. Uh, and then if you care about sun stars, here's just, there you go. There's some sun stars for you. Again, no, no, I shouldn't rain to the sun. And then look at the, look at the black levels. I, no real complaints whatsoever. This shot was just give it an absolute extreme test. We've got the light coming in at a crazy angle. I wanted to test the flare and I also wanted to see how that affect our fringing. And this is the worst I could make this lens perform when it comes to fringing. If I show you sort of the worst area here, if we look at this, 
these sort of bokeh orbs here. This is your the maximum amount of discoloration you're going to see on this lens if you use a crazy setup like this. And as far as loca, as we come up here, you can start to see a little bit. There's a little bit of loca going on. But I mean, see this little fringing just outside there? It is so minimal. It is so well controlled. Now I've just got a few images to show you color. And you can see the transition from the part that's in focus to out of focus. I think it's really smooth, really nice. Uh, same thing here. This is a busier shot, so we can see if it's doing anything weird and swirly or whatever, which I wouldn't say so. Again, the shot is busy, but I think it did really well to, to work within that. This one's to see if we have any fringing against the sky. And again, really clean lines along that branch there and really nice separation. I think the colors are rich. And here's a photo of a dog. When you're on a photo walk and you see a dog, you have to take a picture of it. There's the doggy face and there's the doggy nipples. Squirrel. Look at him. Got his mouth full. Uh, but yeah, it's nice. It's really, really sharp. This was at 200 mil. Uh, again, no issues with, with chromatic aberration. Really happy with the separation. Really, really good detail. We can get right in there. You can see all those little whiskers. Good squirrel. Color, again, really, really rich. Uh, this is straight out of camera. Really like the color here. I like the sky, I like the leaves. Another example of color here is some green for you. And again, separation and how it transitions. So yeah, you know, image quality wise, this lens is incredibly impressive, especially when we're comparing it to the G Master 2, which is obviously the reigning champion of 70 to 200 millimeter lenses on the Sony system. It's darn near as good or slightly better. Like it's right there neck and neck when it comes to image quality, but for like $1,300 US less. So it's kind of a no brainer if you can get over some of the annoyances that I had with the actual handling of the lens. So good job, Sigma. Great lens. It's always great to see a third party offering that offers so much for the money and they definitely nailed it here. All right, I'm done.